In the past two weeks, the number of coronavirus cases outside China has increased 13-fold, and the number of affected countries has tripled. In the U.S., emergency action to provide financial relief for workers and European travel bans have been put into place as the markets continue to fall. Joining us now to talk more about the impact of coronavirus on our economy is Professor of Economics Richard Wolf. Great to see you, sir. Thank you. Glad to be here. Absolutely. What do we expect in terms of economic impacts? At, at this point, it's honestly hard to even wrap your head around. It is very, very difficult. And, and there, the signs, I hate to tell you this, are all very, very negative. Whether you look at the stock market, which is down again severely today. But even more important, to think back a week, the Federal Reserve cuts interest rates supposedly to help the situation. What it does, in fact, is convince many on Wall Street and around the world that the situation is much more dire than they had been led to expect. To have the President of the United States basically mock the whole business as not serious, and then the Federal Reserve cut the interest rates a historic 50 points in, in one uh, day, is such a contradiction that the net result is to make everyone understand we're at the edge of a very serious precipice, and it looks like we're going over the edge. And under these circumstances, everyone with any minimum sense of prudence pulls back. And, uh, Professor, this is something I've been trying to highlight, which is that 70 percent, I saw this from Annie Linsky over at The Atlantic, of the U.S. economy is consumer spending. And so with that 70 percent of consumer spending, even a marginal drop can send the U.S. economy into recession. I mean, how much of a drop in spending can we expect? I mean, how long? And, and just, just outline what impact that has on our economy and the whole. Well, the, the cutback of consumer spending is already underway. And obviously, if you forbid airplanes to come from Europe to this country when they have arguably done a better job over there than we have it is a bizarre uh, kind of failure to deal with the scope of the problem. Giving a, 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 a tax cut, a withholding, a, you don't have to have a, the withholding tax as one other idea. Uh, people are not going to malls because they fear for their lives. Putting a few more bucks in their check at the end of the week is not going to change their decision not to go to the mall, not to go to the restaurant. Uh, to, they're going to have to deal with all the children coming back from colleges that are closing, including the one where I teach, uh, suddenly and without preparation. I mean, right. you have a, a general collapse. But let me, let me focus you on other signs. We are a debt-ridden economy. The level of government, corporate, and individual debt is greater than it has ever been in our history. And that's partly a response of trying to cope with the last crash of our economic system in 2008 and 9. But what it means is any company now that sees a drop in consumer spending, for example, who's making its profits go down, it's no longer something that can be contained because with profits going down, they're going to be calling their banks to inform them that they can't repay the debts that they have used to build up in the last 20 years. And therefore, we're looking at a kind of contagion through the credit markets that can be more destabilizing than even the contagion of the disease and right. its impact on right. consumer spending. Yeah. So well said. I mean, what kind of economic stimulus or measures would you even recommend at this point? Because to your point, I mean, look, they floated a payroll tax cut. Well, if you don't have a job, that's not helping you at all. Um, you know, even putting money sort of directly into people's pockets. Um, it's hard to say that that would really help the economy that much because, as you point out, if people are staying home, they're not going out, they're not spending, period, then how much of a difference will that ultimately make? I don't think it'll make a significant amount of difference. You have to take huge measures, which is what this government and the ideology that has governed American economic policy for so long doesn't want to do. It keeps telling itself the private sector is the efficient way, the appropriate way. Well, the private sector is what got us into this mess, a private medical system, a government regulation long captured by them. We are faced now with a need for radical change in a society confronted with a radical scare, but without the capacity to think creatively. For yeah. example, for example, other countries have taken steps. In Italy, they've told people you don't have to pay your mortgage anymore. Okay, now that's a major step. We haven't even discussed that sort of thing. 
in South Korea, all immigrants, whether they are illegal or not, are guaranteed to be freely tested with no consequence for their immigration status, no sharing of information among government agencies. Even these things probably won't be enough, but they are light years ahead of the marginal, minor adjustments that are being considered by the government here. That's yeah. why the WHO was so upset, not just by the spread of the virus, but by the inaction in so many parts of the world, which, by the way, was a polite way of pointing the finger at the United States. And, uh, Professor, you pointed out something which I really want to touch on, which is that this could really tip us over the edge in terms of corporate debt, that the, because so much of our economy is debt ridden, that even if we were to pump liquidity, let's say cash into the economy, a lot of it would just be spent on fulfilling people's debt obligations and keeping that worrying. It wouldn't necessarily give it a boost, right? So what can we actually do to get out of something like this? You'd have to radically create in my mind, a commitment on the part of this society to deal with at least the front lines of the chaos that is now engulfing us. And that means a radical public. This cannot be done by a private enterprise or any collection of private enterprise. This has to be a marshalling the way we do in a war, a war, you know, like in World War One or Two, we have to marshal our resources. And if you remember, in World War One or Two, we threw aside private enterprise. I want to remind everyone, during World War Two, we had rationing in this country because we did not believe that allowing the market to function was an adequate way of responding to the need to survive in a deadly war. We have to take steps like that large steps to test everyone. The testing in this country is months behind what it should have been. We yeah. have states in the United States where nobody has been tested. And mm -hmm. when you hear the president and others say, we have only so many confirmed uh, coronavirus uh, people, that's not because we don't have many people with the disease. It's because we haven't tested anybody in this country. And right. that has to be done on a massive scale. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we're not coming anywhere close to that. Not at all. Professor, how well positioned is the American working class to be able to sustain this kind of economic blow? Very, very poorly. Look, the Federal Reserve does that interesting survey in which they ask families across the country, if you had a sudden unexpected expense of $400, could you meet that or would you have to either sell something you own or take a second job? And something just under 50% says they have to sell something or take a second job. They have no cushion to handle $400. When you raise it to $1,000, a clear majority in the neighborhood of 60% of the American people, and that's the working class, a large bulk of it, can't do that. And you're talking about a crisis now that is going to hamper their well-being far beyond those amounts of money. So the question is, you've got to come in with a massive government program to help people, again, akin to what was done, for example, in the 1930s, or else you're not serious. Yeah, well, thank you, Professor, for breaking this down for us, as always. Wish it was under better circumstances. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your insights. Thank, thank you, Professor. You, I and I appreciate that you're bringing this kind of realism to the conversation in the United States. We badly need it. Yeah, Thank sadly, you, sir. Sadly, we do. All right. We'll have more rising for you right after this.